Welcome to this service of worship brought to you by Monroe Street Church. Today is the first Sunday of the season of Epiphany. We just concluded uh, the 12 days of Christmas that brings us to the day of Epiphany and the Epiphany season. On January 6, the Christian church remembered the arrival of the Magi bringing their gifts to the baby Jesus. The word epiphany comes from the Greek word meaning manifestation or appearance. During this season, we recognize Jesus being made known to the world, represented by the Magi coming from their far country. May Jesus become known to us in a deeper way this coming epiphany season. I'm Larry Clark, who along with Pastor Elizabeth Rand have the honor of serving this congregation where our mission is to deepen faith, engage our neighborhood, and become an inclusive community. Pastor Rand will be offering this morning's message. We are members of the Reconciling Congregation Movement of the United Methodist Church, committed to being an inclusive family of God. 
including persons of all racial, ethnic, economic, social, sexual, and gender identities. We are glad that you are worshiping with us today. Welcome. Will you pray with me? Loving, gracious, holy God, who brought your people through the wilderness so long ago, who was with Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism, we long to feel your presence with us now as we live through a wilderness filled with a pandemic disease, political unrest in our nation, divisions within our church denomination, and continued challenges for those who need the very basics in life, food, shelter, and warmth. We feel we've been in this wilderness for years, even though it's only been 11 months since we heard about the coronavirus. And we feel that we've faced so many challenges in this wilderness as loved ones have suffered from the disease, some dying from it, as people have lost jobs and livelihoods, as we have felt distant from the support systems that we depend upon for our emotional support. Lord, thank you 
that you make your presence known to us in ways we can understand. We give thanks for the medical science which has brought about vaccines to begin to eradicate the dangers of the pandemic. Thank you for calling us to be people who reassure others that the vaccines are because you have worked in the lives of scientists and medical professionals to make it happen. As we watched the happenings in Washington, D.C. this past Wednesday, many of us were reading our devotions that focused on the epiphany the season of your light shining in the darkness of this world. Yet we were stunned when some misguided people stormed our nation's capital and vandalized the building and caused the death of five people. We're in shock and feel the darkness swallowing up our well-being, our shalom. O oh God, thank you for shining your light on us, for giving us your Holy Spirit so that we can see the light overcoming the darkness of these times. Thank you for assuring us of your presence in this time of chaos. As we give thanks for the signs of your light in these dark times, we turn our hearts toward those who suffer and are in need of your light. We pray for those from among us who are sick and suffering and grieving the death of loved ones. We pray for our brothers and sisters of color who continue to be afraid when they go out because of the racism that exists in the hearts of so many. We pray for all people who suffer at the hands of tyrant governments. Help us to know that we are truly blessed to live where we do and that it is up to us to make life better for those who struggle, whether from sickness, poverty, racism, classism, or any of the other isms that we use to separate ourselves from each other. Our plea on this day is that you will strengthen us as people of faith in Jesus Christ to be strong in the face of that darkness that seeks to overcome us and extinguish the Christ-like within us. And we pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, our mother, our father, who is in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory, 
and all of this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Let us pray. Loving God, open our eyes that we may see you everywhere. Amen. Our hearts are breaking, our fury shaking, our souls are tired, our breath is gone. We cry, how long, O Lord, this evil season? African-American composer Mark Miller wrote this song after the death of George Floyd, and people began marching on behalf of black lives. We sing this song today because its words resonate just as much now as they did then. We will long remember the events of this week. As we watched the Confederate flag paraded through the U.S. Capitol building, and we wondered if our president would be impeached for a second time for inciting violence. And more than 4,000 people died of COVID day after day after day. This week provided stark images of hard truths that we are being forced to face about our country. A black man goes bird watching in Central Park and a white woman calls the police on him. Black voters have to travel far distances and stand in long lines because the polling places in their neighborhoods were shut down. The police response to the crowds who violently took over the Capitol building looked very different than what we saw this summer when people marched peacefully in support of black lives. The pandemic continues and some people still refuse to wear masks or make any sacrifices at all in order to protect their neighbors or to support those healthcare workers who are overwhelmed and exhausted and getting sick themselves. These are hard truths to face. They are, in fact, manifestations of evil, injustice, and oppression in our country, and they cause great suffering. How, then, do we respond to the evil words and actions we experience in these days? Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and the Holy Spirit descended on him and filled him as God's voice rang in his ears, saying, you are my beloved son. Washed in the waters of baptism, we too begin by hearing of our belovedness. God says to you and God says to me, you are my beloved child. We are blessed, beautiful, beloved, all of us. We are filled with the Holy Spirit who breathes in us and speaks God's word into our hearts. God's word is love. You and I are created in love and filled with love to be love. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. The evil one said to Jesus, You're hungry! Well, surely, since you're the Son of God, you can turn these stones into loaves of bread. Look, if you worship me, I can give you all the kingdoms of the world and make you more powerful than you can imagine. Now let's see how much God really loves you. Throw yourself off the temple and see if God's angels will save you. Jesus responded to these taunting words by claiming his true identity, knowing himself to be a child of God, whose very nature and essence was love. 
He said, my life comes from God, not from loaves of bread. I worship God. I trust God. I know myself to be love. And out of this love, I will resist you, tempter. I will overcome the powers and principalities that threaten God's will for me and for the world. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, living in an in-between life as they moved from captivity in Egypt toward life in the Promised Land. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness as he moved between his hidden life of preparation toward his public life of ministry. And friends, we too are living our wilderness life in between what we used to consider normal before the pandemic and the new world that lies ahead of us. In the wilderness of these days, the evil one is showing up and the evil one looks like racism in its many forms and leaders who tell lies and incite violence and people who call public health measures an assault on their freedom. And yet, there is a gift in this time too, because we cannot not see how we harm one another through our hate, through our fear, through our selfishness. And because we, like Jesus, can choose to say no to this way of being and live as our true selves, as children of God, whose very essence and nature is love. This makes it possible for us too to resist evil and injustice and create a world where there is healing, there is goodness, there is forgiveness, there is kinship. Right after 9-11, when I couldn't stand to watch the news, I found myself immersed in the Harry Potter books. I became enchanted by the story of a boy learning who he was and finding within himself the courage and love to overcome the presence of evil in his world. This week, I found my way to a different storyteller, to Father Greg Boyle who tells stories about the men and women he shares life with through Homeboy and Homegirl Industries, a ministry that supports people when they leave gangs. Gang culture is tribal. If you are in my gang, you are my friend and I will give up my life for you. But if you are in another gang, you are my enemy. And if you step on my turf, I will kill you. One of the biggest challenges of becoming part of the community at Homeboy is learning how to coexist with and even befriend people who came from rival gangs, who you still see as your enemies. This is its own wilderness experience as the men and women of Homeboy and Homegirl Industries move from the captivity of gang life into a new, more spacious world on the other side claiming their own identities as beloved children of God on the journey. Here is one of my favorite Father Greg Boyle stories. He writes, <clears throat> It would not be uncommon to ask Fabian how he's doing and then hear him respond, I'm feeling zestfully clean, thank you. It may go without saying that I have never encountered a homeboy quite like Fabian, said Father Greg. Few homeboys are able to incorporate in their conversation, pip pip cheerio, or belittle your obvious response to something with elementary, my dear Watson. Greg says Fabian, now in his late 20s and married with three kids, worked for years at Homeboy Industries. Now he has a well-paying job and is as decent a human being as I know. 
He's just so uniquely a person like no other. His childhood was a dense mixture of gangster father, mentally ill mother, and no one ever really in their right minds, always high, all the time. But somehow, by a mysterious and gracious turn of some steering wheel, Fabian found other coordinates and navigated his way out of the treacherous waters where others perished. Fabian was spectacular at building good and enduring relationships with his enemies at Homeboy. His tenderness knew no equal, really. He would visit an enemy undergoing brutal chemotherapy and supply him with videos to distract him from the ordeal. Once, Fabian was stuck in the back seat of a car filled with his homeboys who were giving him a ride home. Hey, look, one of them screams in the car, that's that fool, Froggy. The alarmist in the car is pointing at an enemy walking by himself on First Street. Let's take him down. The car pulls over and Fabian works his magic. Kick back, you guys, that's my primo. He's your cousin? Yeah, my aunt's son. And the car swerves back into traffic. Froggy was an enemy Fabian had come to know from our office. They are not related. I don't know just how Fabian managed it. Father Greg says, with more mystery than I can explain away, Fabian locked onto the singularity of that love that melts you. It doesn't melt who you are, but who you are not. Turns out he wasn't all the abuse he endured. He was something else, astonishing and glorious. Friends, when we are living in the wilderness, in between what was and what will be, and evil shows up, and maybe it looks like our enemy, it is our chance to show up as ourselves, as love. And maybe, just maybe, by doing so, something about our relationship changes and something in the world changes. And then we find out who we really are, something astonishing and glorious and absolutely ready to make a world in which we live with one another as kin, as brothers and sisters who know themselves as beautiful and beloved. And we can trust that Julian of Norwich, who lived through her own pandemic, spoke words that are true. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. May it be so.
hard days, please remember this. You are a beautiful, blessed, beloved child of God in whom Christ dwells and delights. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you live safely and securely in God's kingdom which has no end. Go in peace.